All right, the title of the sermon this morning is When Your Children Ask. When Your Children Ask. When Your Children Ask. So if you noticed as we read through Deuteronomy 4, like it's so easy for us to forget about God, forget to do the things of God, and um, sometimes God puts things in our lives to, you know, remind us of things and also to show our children. So when our children ask us why we do things, we have an opportunity to teach them about the things of God. Um, you know, when you have children in your life, you know, you start to reflect on your own spiritual walk, you know, because now you have to be an example to somebody, right? And, and what sort of example are you going to set? So that's the theme of the sermon this morning, is I want you to reflect on your own spiritual walk and your own priorities and things like that. Um, so when your children ask, what will you say? How will you respond? What will they see of you? And even if you're somebody without children, <coughs> you know, this is why sometimes Christians in their life don't grow spiritually because they're not open enough about their faith. They don't go soul winning. They don't talk to people about Jesus. People don't know that they're a Christian. You know, but part of healthy spiritual growth is that you are bold in your testimony and bold in your witness. People know you're a Christian because that somewhat keeps you accountable too. So even if you don't have children that are maybe watching you and following after your example, wondering why you do things, they may be unbelievers questioning why you do certain things. And this is why I think in John 15, when the Bible talks about believers bearing fruit, that the branches that attempt to bear more fruit God purges, and you'll notice that in your life, that when you try and start living for God, you start trying to share the gospel, you start, start trying to do things right, you start thinking more about the things that you do and the testimony you leave and the example that you set. But then when people start backsliding and they don't care about they stop, they, they're a bit more of a hidden Christian, they don't care so much about the things that they do and it's a cycle the other way. So the title of the sermon is When Your Children Ask. And what I wanted to go through this morning is I wanted to show, one, that God wants us to be diligent about teaching the things of God to our children, to the next generation. And we all play a part in that. And I wanted to show some examples in the Bible where God sets up ordinances. He sets up memorials. And he uses those to teach the next generation. Right, so firstly, that's, that's the first section of this sermon this morning, is we need to diligently teach our children. Diligently teach your children. And even if you don't have children, we still want to be diligent about teaching the next generation of Christians, being a good example to other Christians, even though we don't have children. Right, so where we read in Deuteronomy 4, look at what the Bible says here. Behold, I have taught you statutes and judgments, even as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should do so in the land whither you go to possess it. Keep, therefore, and do them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. Right? You see how often they do them, it's all right, they're going to hear them, and they do them, and then, then people will look to them and say, Look, surely this is a great nation is a wise and understanding people. But what nation is there so great, who hath God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all things that we call upon him for? And what nation is there so great, and hath statutes and judgments so righteous as all this law which I set before you this day? So is it enough to have God's laws? Is it enough to be doing them yourself? No, he goes on, verse 9, only take heed to thyself. So obviously it starts with you. It starts with you making sure you're doing them, making sure you know them and understand them, and making sure you understand that they are these great laws and commandments and statutes, right? So take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently, lest thou forget the things which thine eyes have seen, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them thy sons and thy sons' sons. See, so we have to be diligent ourselves 
and then be diligent about teaching them to thy sons and thy sons' sons. Now, unfortunately, many Christians are not diligent about the things of God, and they're not diligent and taking heed to themselves. And, you know, you see it in your own life. You start to forget the things which thine eyes have seen, lest they de- and they'll depart from your heart. And if you're not careful, they may, may, you may forget them and they depart from out all the days of your life and then you don't end up teaching your sons and your sons' sons. Deuteronomy 6, so there's two chapters later and this is a chapter, we, I want to read the whole chapter because like we read through all of Deuteronomy 4, there's a similar theme through Deuteronomy 6 too. Now these are the commandments, the statutes and the judgments which the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land whither you go to possess it that thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. See, back then, you know, it may be, it may be alluding to like physically prolonging the days, right? Because when they did it, God's judgment came on them and you know, there was laws about cleanness and just righteous living and things like that. But when I think about the application in the New Testament, you know, obviously we don't do this to be saved, so it's not talking about salvation. But I do think about it in terms of leaving that Christian legacy. So, you know, like if we do not keep the statutes, we're not diligent about keeping the statutes, we're not diligent about teaching our children, will we prolong the days of fundamental Bible-believing Christianity? Or if we are not diligent about these things, and we're not diligent about setting the example for the next generation, in three or four generations, you know, what, what will Christianity be like amongst Bible believers? Hear therefore, o Israel, and observe to do it, that it may be well with thee, and that ye may increase mightily, as the Lord God of thy fathers has promised thee in the land that floweth with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Look, look, look as we read this passage. This, what, what picture do you get of the relationship of the believer with God's word? Right? Is it something you only hear on Sundays? You know, is it something that, you know, you're scrolling through Facebook, you see a verse, it's, oh, it's God's word. In a different Bible version, you know, the NIV. No, it's not. What picture do you get? You get a picture where the, the people of God know the word of God intimately and it's, it's a part of their everyday life. It's just something that, that flows through them and they, they talk about it because it's just, they can relate it to every part of life and it's just, just something that the family talks about. It's not just something the family does on Sunday and throughout the week you never talk about it. You know, that's not, that's not how we're going to raise a generation and teach our sons and our sons' sons. Thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates, and it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have brought thee into the land, which he sware unto thy fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give thee great and goodly cities which thou buildest not, and houses full of all good things which thou fillest not, and wells digged which thou digst not, vineyards and olive trees which thou plantest not. When thou shalt have eaten and be full, then beware. Right, what is he talking about? See, once... God blesses you with prosperity and you don't take heed to yourself and to God's word, then beware, lest thou forget the Lord which brought thee forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. See, see God knows the gravitational pull of sin that we are against. That he's saying, that's why you've got to be diligent. You've got to be diligent that you have it in your heart, that you do it, You've got to be diligent that you teach it to your children because you know what? When life gets easy, God blesses you with prosperity, you know what the tendency is? To start to forget the things of God, right? That's why, you know, now life is easy again. COVID, the, the COVID drama is past. 
people forget things of God. You know, that's why sometimes it's good. It's good for God's people to go through a bit of tough times, right? Makes them consider the things of God. And that's why God has to bring them through tough times. That's why, why do you think God is constantly bringing chastisement on the nation of Israel, judgment and things, because they forget about God. And if he doesn't, then this is what happens. Thou shalt fear the Lord thy God and serve him and shalt swear by his name. You shall not go after other gods of the gods of the people which are round about you. Now, many times in the Old Testament, God talks about them going after other gods and idolatry. And what I want you to think about this morning is that, yeah, maybe we don't put a statue of an elephant in our house or build some graven image and bow down to it, Remember, covetousness, the Bible says, which is idolatry. And that often becomes the first world idol, which is just living your life for money and for comfort, for pleasures of this life. Right? That becomes our God and not the God of the Bible. For the Lord thy God is a jealous God among you, lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee and destroy thee from off the face of the earth. So, you know, you don't want to take this too literally in the Old Testament because in the New Testament because we have the Old Covenant, remember, so it's alluding to these things as well. So physically, yes, the nation was judged, but spiritually it's alluding to the Old Covenant, right? But that doesn't mean that we are not exhorted by Old Testament scriptures to live right, right? And we are exhorted by, by our loving Heavenly Father. So the attitude here from God is a little bit different as well, right? Because it's a bit of black and white, blessing and cursing. So what I want you to take as we read through this passage is not the attitude of God towards you if you do not live the way we ought. What we want is we want the, the exhortation to live right. We don't want to disappoint our Heavenly Father who loves us. Right? So just be, be, be cognizant of that as we read through Old Testament passages. You shall not tempt the Lord your God as you tempted him in Massa. You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes we have commanded, which he hath commanded thee. So remember, you know, when your children ask, this is what it's about. This is, this is why I'm going to these passages, right? About diligently keeping God's word so we can be a great example for the next generation. And thou shalt do that which is right and good in the sight of the Lord, that it may be well with thee, that thou mayest go in and possess the good land which the Lord swear unto thy fathers. So, like in the Old Testament, you know, it's about, you know, possessing land, inheritance, physical land that God has given them. I think about spiritually, like God has given us things to claim, like making ground spiritually. But then if we don't live diligently, we don't teach our children, we start losing that ground spiritually, if that makes sense. So that's what I think about, like with this war with the people of the land. Like if they do right and they obey the commandments of the Lord, they, they conquer, they start, their influence starts to spread physically. And the way I see that, like I said, the New Testament is if Christians live righteous, if Christians are diligent, if Christians are diligent about teaching the next generation, being a good example to people in the church and other Christians, we will gain more ground, right? To cast out all thine enemies, verse 19, before thee, as the Lord hath spoken. And when thy son asketh thee, remember when, thy, when, their, when your children ask? When thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgment which the Lord our God hath commanded you? See, you think about the time when one day, you know, a lot of you have very young children. Maybe they're not asking you these questions. But one day they will, right? They're going to ask you, Hey, what? What mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments of the Lord? What are you going to answer them when your children ask you? Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us up, brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand. The Lord showed signs and wonders, great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, upon all his household, before our eyes. See, there there's now an opportunity to teach your children the things of God. You've got to be ready to to know these things, that you don't forget these things. Because he says, if you're not diligent, you don't keep these things in your heart, you're going to forget, and you won't be ready to teach your children and for them to take you seriously. And he brought us out from thence, that he might bring us in to give us the land which he swore unto our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord our God, 
for our good always, that he might preserve us alive, as it is, as at this day. And it shall be our righteousness if we observe to do all these commandments before the Lord our God, as he hath commanded. So when your children ask, and they ask about the laws, will you be able to say this to them? And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes. So what will you answer them? That's what I want you to think about this morning. So you can see from Deuteronomy 4 and Deuteronomy 6, we are fighting against, the, the scales are weighted against us, if that makes sense. Right? There is a gravi gravitational pull of sin that if we do not do over and above what is normal, right, we will start losing this battle. Right? This is why it's so important that you know, if you are not diligent about doing right, about doing the things of God and living, trying to live a righteous life and being purposeful in teaching your children about the things of God, the scales are weighted against you. Now, everyone is concerned, you know, when we raise our children. Will they grow up to be saved? Will they grow up to love God? Will they grow up to serve God? You know, we think about these things. Hey, I am concerned about these things too. You say, Victor, how can you be concerned about these things? Well, because it's not... It's, it's more than just going to church, you know, and being a Christian. It, it needs to be more than that to actually raise a godly generation. I mean, how many times have you seen, you know, they talk about Christian children leaving the church, people that grow up in church when they're older, they're not in church anymore. Because, like I said, the scales are weighted against us. It's going to take more than just being saved and just going to church inconsistently to make sure that our children grow up and are saved and love God and serve God. So that's, thing, that's like one thing I'm concerned about. I hope you guys are concerned as well. You know, in order to raise godly children, it's going to take more than just being lukewarm. And if you are lukewarm in your Christianity, it's not weighing the scales in your children's favour as they grow up. You know, that's, that's one thing that concerns me with my children. That's one thing that concerns me in the church too. You know, that's why we've got to be serious about these things. And that's the thing we see in Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 6. Do we take the things of God seriously? Are we diligent? What's diligent mean? You do it with purpose. You do it with understanding. You do it consistently. You discipline. Diligently. Is it in your heart? Is it part of your life? Right? So that when you walk by the way, and you lie us down, you rise us up, you know, you give your children the best chance to live, you know, to, to grow up and, and be the way we, all, we want them to be, right? And to continue um, the fight even when we're gone. That's one thing I think about. So let's look at a few passages in the Bible where God sets up ordinances to make sure that we are teaching our children. You know, but like I said, we've got to be diligent about it. Exodus 12, we, let's look at the Passover. So we won't read the first part of the chapter where God says, hey, you know, this is the Passover. Every man of you take a lamb and do all these things. And you know, the Passover, they put, put the blood on the doorpost and then he would pass over them, right? So we get to verse 21. So this is when they actually go and do it. So he's teaching them what to do. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, draw out, and take you a lamb according to your families, and kill the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop, and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And sometimes I think about the night of the Passover, like in Egypt. And, you know, it would have been a hard thing to believe, right? Like to, to think, oh, this curse is coming. And every, you know, and, and the Egyptians just had no idea what was about to hit. 
And, you know, when you read through the, the chapter in Exodus 12, it's like this great cry through all of Egypt. And you can, you can imagine. I mean, imagine you know, even today, just, you know, the, the weeping that you would hear through the streets if everyone woke up and, and there was not one dead in every household. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a crazy thing, you know, I, I sometimes think about. It was, uh, it was, quite, a, it was quite, a, quite, a, quite a judgment that went through Egypt, but, you know, they... You know, they, they should have, all they had to do was, uh, you know, have blood on their doorposts, you know, to be saved from that judgment. That's a great picture of salvation. And you shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. And it shall come to pass when you be come to the land which the Lord will give you according as he hath promised that ye shall keep this service. And it shall come to pass when your children shall say unto you, What mean ye by this service? That ye shall say, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover who passed over the houses of the children of Israel in Egypt when he smote the Egyptians and delivered our houses and the people bowed the head and worshipped. The children of Israel went away and did as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so did they. So we see the Passover is one of the ordinances that was given by God to remember, you know, when they came out of Egypt. And it's very interesting that the way they came out of Egypt, you know, when you read through the Passover story, they ate the Passover, he said, make sure when you eat the Passover, you have your shoes on because they immediately were going to leave out of Egypt. You know, so they had to be ready. And then when they left, they asked to borrow things from their neighbours. And God gave them favour in the eyes of their neighbours and their neighbours gave them more over an abundance what they needed and then that's how they spoiled the Egyptians. You know, so they went out with, you know, with things and, and many things as they went out of Egypt. Exodus 13 is the next chapter over. And it shall be, so this is another ordinance that they were given, it was a sacrifice. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring thee into the land of the Canaanites, as he swear unto thee and to thy fathers, and shall give it thee, that thou, shalt, that thou shalt set apart unto the Lord all that openeth the matrix, and every firstling that cometh of a beast which thou hast, the males shall be the Lord. So this is like the firstborn, when it says openeth the matrix, like the first child that any animal has, the first child that any uh, lady has. And every firstling of an ass thou shalt redeem with a lamb, and if thou wilt not redeem it, then thou shalt break his neck, and all the firstborn of man among thy children shalt thou redeem. So there were some sacrifice, sacrifice laws um, surrounding um, the firstborn. And this is even prior to the Levitical priesthood, right? And it shall be when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What is this that thou shalt say unto him, By strength of hand the Lord brought us out from Egypt, from the house of bondage. So again, another situation where God knows, hey, I want you to be ready. I want you to be able to teach your children. When thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, what is this? That thou shalt say unto him, by strength of hand, the Lord brought us out from Egypt, from the house of bondage. And it came to pass when Pharaoh would hardly let us go that the Lord slew all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrifice to the Lord, all that openeth the matrix, being males, for all the first one of my children I redeem. And it shall be for a token upon thine hand and for frontlets between thine eyes, for by strength of hand the Lord brought us forth out of Egypt. So we see here two ordinances that God has instituted, right? A sacrifice with the Passover and another sacrifice to redeem the firstborn. Because he knows, hey, well, if we do these things, then children will ask. So what I want you to reflect on with these passages is, See, what if you don't do the things that is required in Christianity? You know, these are just two examples of things and ordinances that God set for the nation. But think about the statutes, the commandments. You know, what if you don't read your Bible? You know, what if you never pray in your house? Will your children even ask you these things? What if you don't go soul winning ever and you never preach the gospel? You know, will you have these opportunities to teach your children why you do these things and will you have any clout when you explain it to them when you don't do it yourself? You know, it's like, yeah, this is why they do these things. And there your children are thinking, well, why don't you do them? That's what children think. You know, and I, I think us growing up probably thought the same thing with our parents when our parents said one thing but did another. Didn't it have less impact on you the values that your parents might have tried to teach you if they weren't consistent with the things that they believed, the things that they said were good to do. 
right? So this is what I mean by you are weighing the scales against them. So we have things like this in the New Testament too. This is what communion is when we break bread. For I have received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. After the same manner also he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as off as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. So you see that there is this constant reminder of what God did for us, that we must partake of his body and his blood in order to be saved spiritually. There's that constant reminder. So God sets up things like this to constantly remind us. Why? Because we are easily forgetful. And this is why it's so important to be diligent in your Christian life, because the tendency is to go away from God, not to go towards God. But Let's look at a couple of other examples. So I want to show you just some other stories in the Bible that might be of interest uh, along this theme of creating memorials. You know, like people create memorials today. Like we were at Warragamba Dam and there, you know, there was a memorial there of the people that built the dam and things like that. And it's, it's all very interesting. I'm not against things like that. I don't, I don't think it's necessarily wrong to create a memorial. You know, some people will jump the gun and say, oh, it's idolatry and all things like that. Remember, idolatry is not the building of the statue. It's not the building of the memorial. Idolatry is the worshipping of that memorial, right? So it's not necessarily wrong to, to put memorials up and for them to remind us of things and to give us an opportunity to teach and remind the next generation. Now, there's two in Joshua I want to show you. So Joshua 1, 4, 1. It came to pass... When all the people were clean, passed over Jordan, that the Lord spake unto Joshua, saying. So what's the context here? Did you know, so we know that when Moses went through the Red Sea uh, with the children of Israel, we know the miraculous event that happened, you know, the parting of the Red Sea. But do you know that that was not the only time that water was parted in the Bible? Right? There are Two other, I mean, you could say three if you count the third one as two events. But there are two other areas where seas were parted. One is this story, when they are going into the Promised Land and they're passing over Jordan and the priests are carrying the Ark of the Covenant. They walk into the water and the seas part for Israel to walk over the river Jordan, right? So if you remember, there were two and a half tribes that stayed on one half of the river, and then the rest passed over to go to war, right? To claim the land. So that is one time. Does anyone know the, the third time? Who knows the third time when waters were, whew, and they walked through water. Does anyone remember? <laughs> well, Joshua is the one we're looking at now. What's the other one? Do you know something? Yeah, very good. So Elijah and Elisha. So when Elijah is taken up in a whirlwind, he strikes the water with his mantle, you know, his part, and then when Elisha comes back, he strikes it again and says, where is the Lord God, Elisha? And the waters part. Right, so there's a few parting of the waters, uh, which is interesting. So this is one. Take you 12. So what happens is, so after they've passed over, Joshua says to them, take you 12 men out of the people, out of every tribe of man, and command you them, saying, take you hence, out of the midst of Jordan, out of the place where the priest's feet stood firm, twelve stones, and you shall carry them over with you and leave them in the lodging place where you shall lodge this night. So this is something interesting that I didn't realise before. I knew about this story, but the, the significance of the stones. So I just thought that they took twelve stones and just made a memorial. But the significance of the stones is that these stones were taken from inside the river, right? So that's why the, the stones were taken where the priest stood on dry land in the river. So the memorial was, well, here's these 12 stones, and these are not just any stones. These stones came from inside the river, right? And now we were able to take them out, and this is why these stones are here. Then Joshua called the 12 men, whom he had prepared of the children of Israel, out of every tribe of man. And Joshua said unto them, Pass over before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of Jordan, and take ye up every man of your stone upon his shoulder, according unto the number of the tribes of the children of Israel that this may be a sign among you that, look, that when your children ask, so 
this is the passage where I got the title of the sermon. When your children ask their fathers in time to come, saying, What mean ye by these stones? Then ye shall answer them that the waters of Jordan were cut off before the ark of the covenant of the Lord when it passed over Jordan. The waters of Jordan were cut off, and these stones shall be for a memorial unto the children of Israel forever. And the children of Israel did so as Joshua commanded and took up twelve stones out of the midst of Jordan as the Lord spake unto Joshua according to the number of the tribes of the children of Israel and carried them over with them unto the place where they lodged and laid them down there. And Joshua set up twelve stones in the midst of Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests which bear the ark of the covenant stood. And they are there unto this day. So again, being diligent, we're talking about being diligent to teach the next generation and we're just looking at passages where memorials were set up to remind the children of the things of God. The last uh, passage I want to go to is in Joshua 22. Joshua 22. So this is uh, similar to when they passed over but this is now after all the wars are fought. Do you remember this story? And the tribe of Reuben, Gad, and the half-tribe of Manasseh, which were the tribes that had decided to stay on the other side of Jordan, they've now fought all the wars with the 12 tribes of Israel, and they're going back to live in the land that they inherited, which was on the other side of Jordan. Then the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh answered and said unto the heads of the thousands of Israel, The Lord God of gods, the Lord God of gods, he knoweth, and Israel he shall know, if it be in rebellion, or if in transgression against the Lord, save us not this day. So why are they responding this way? Because they built an altar, and the rest of the tribes of Israel came out to war against them because they thought they had built this altar to sacrifice unto the Lord in a place where God had not permitted them, right? And bring wrath on all the nation of Israel. But they explain that we have built us an altar they're saying we haven't done it this, this, that we have built, we haven't to build us an altar to turn from following the Lord, or if to offer thereon burnt offering or meat offerings, or if to offer peace offerings thereon, let the Lord Himself require it, saying, Hey, if we've done it for the wrong reasons, then let God judge us. But if we have not rather done it, no, this is the reason why we've done it, for fear of this thing, saying, In time to come, your children might speak unto our children, saying, What have ye to do? with the Lord God of Israel. You see how they had a mindset of what's going to happen down the line? What's going to be the next generations? What are they going to behave like? What are they going to ask? What are they going to know? And that's what I'm asking you to think about this morning when your children ask, do you have a mindset of what spiritual legacy we're leaving for the next generations? That's why it's going to matter how you live and how it matter what you know and what you do and how diligent you are. For the Lord hath made Jordan a border between us and you, ye children of Reuben and children of Gad. Ye have no part in the Lord. So shall your children make our children cease from fearing the Lord. You know, because, you know, what if one day your children don't live in the same city you live? What if they move countries? What if they live somewhere else? You know, what will you have left with them? Therefore we said, let us now prepare to build us an altar, not for burnt offering, nor for sacrifice, but that it may be a witness between us and you and our generations after us that we might do the service of the Lord before him with our burnt offerings and with our sacrifices and with our peace offerings that your children may not say to our children in time to come, ye have no part in the Lord. Therefore said we that it shall be when they should so say to us or to our generations in time to come that we may say again, behold the pattern of the altar of the Lord which our fathers made not for burnt offerings, nor for sacrifices, but it is a witness between us and you. God forbid that we should rebel against the Lord and turn this day from following the Lord to build an altar for burnt offerings, for meat offerings, and for sacrifices beside the altar of the Lord our God that is before his tabernacle. And when Phineas the priest and the princes of the congregation and the heads of the thousands of Israel which were with him heard the words that the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the children of Manasseh spake, it pleased them. And so that was another example of setting up a memorial, using that memorial as an opportunity to teach the next generations and remind the next generations 
of the truths of God. So in closing, let's just uh, bring it all back to the period of time we are right now, you know, and tying it into Christmas celebrations. <laughs> Should Christians celebrate Christmas? Well, I think it is a matter of conscience, right? It's a matter of convictions on what you want to do. Romans 14, 5. I think this is the verse that best is applicable to celebrating or doing things, traditions that are outside of the Bible, you know, that are not mentioned in the Bible for us to do. One man esteemeth one day above another, another esteemeth every day alike, let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. He that regardeth the day regardeth it unto the Lord, and he that regardeth not the day to the Lord he doth not regard it. He that eateth, eateth to the Lord, for he giveth God thanks, and he that eateth not to the Lord, he eateth not, and giveth God thanks. Right, so should Christians celebrate Christmas? Well, I think it's up to the individual choices of every Christian, like every Christian can decide whether they do it. But one thing I wanted to say, and why I'm preaching this sermon, is one, you know, I wanted to encourage you guys to be diligent about your spiritual life, make sure we teach the next generations and live a life where we weigh the scales in our favour because the scales are weighed against us. But also as a reminder of this time as we go about our holiday celebrations, that whenever we do things for the Lord, it should be an opportunity and a reminder to teach the next generations about the Lord. Right? So when your children ask, why do you do these things? Do you have a good reason? And this is why, you know, if you're going to celebrate Christmas holidays, make sure you make it about Jesus, right? Because you don't want to celebrate holidays and then your children ask, hey, why do we celebrate holidays? And you say, well, it's because of family. And, you know, that might be a noble thing, right? But is that the reason why we celebrate Christmas? Is it just about spending time with family? Right? And things like that. No. It's to remember Jesus Christ coming in the flesh. And then we're, you know, that's the whole idea of the holiday. Was, you know, if you even want to celebrate it. It's meant to be a reminder Jesus Christ was born. Our Saviour came in the flesh. The mystery, the great mystery happened 2,000 years ago that God was manifest in the flesh. Right? It's the same with Easter. And this is why I would discourage you from celebrating Christmas in a way that has nothing to do with Jesus. You know, and I say this probably every year, that Christians ought not to celebrate Christmas with Santa Claus hats and elf cookies and all this stuff, putting reindeers outside their house. Hey, you want to participate in Christmas lights? Why put Santa Claus and elves and reindeer outside? You know, why don't you put at least a cross you know, put something about Jesus outside. You know, so let's not get carried away with how the world celebrates Christmas and let's not even adopt those practices. So when our children ask, Mom, Dad, why do you wear a Santa Claus helmet? Oh, helmet, no, hat. You know, like, what are you going to say to them? You know, why are we always buying elves and things like that? You know, this is why I try and discourage you guys, you know, and I, I try not to be too hard on people that are like are new to our church and maybe don't know, you know, my stance on Christmas and Easter and maybe they bring things like that during the whole festive season. But I would say don't, you know, don't come to church and Santa hats and things like that because I don't want that to be what my children remember about Christmas. I don't want what they remember about Easter to be chocolate bunnies and Easter eggs. That has nothing to do with the death burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So if we're going to remember these holidays and we're going to celebrate these holidays, let's use them as an opportunity to teach our children. So when our children ask, what mean you by these stones? And you can use that as an opportunity to teach them about the things of God. All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, your word. We thank you that you, you have provided us ordinances in the word like baptism and communion, so that we don't forget. But Lord, help us, you know, these, these holidays once a year is not enough to make sure that we raise a godly generation. 
Help us, Lord, to be diligent. Take heed to ourselves and to your commandments so, Lord, we can win this battle against sin and against Satan. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.